Hey, Brian. Hey, Brad. How you good, doing? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Well, yeah, let's one. take advantage of the fact that the mayor was just on stage and that yeah. clip yeah. to talk about our lovely embattled city. I think you're probably like me. We cringe a little bit yeah. when the city's problems are magnified and politicized. Yeah. So, so what do you think your responsibility is and the responsibility of tech leaders to help get the city back on its feet? <sighs> I think I owe a lot to the city of San Francisco personally. You know, my story, I came here in 2007 with nothing, $1,000 the bank. And this community welcomed me with open arms. I, I do not think Airbnb could have been started in any city but San Francisco, at least back then. I do believe now you can kind of probably start a com tech company anywhere, but I think there's something incredibly special about the community here, and notwithstanding the fact that it's kind of a bit of a punching bag around the world in the media, there is still a huge, robust tech community here, and I think AI is creating a second wave of interest. I think generally, like, the number one thing I've learned with cities is not to presume what I can do for a city, not to oh, proactively share ideas, but ask a single question, how can I help? And that's what we try to do in cities around the world. I was backstage with the mayor, and that's what I asked her. I said, how could I help? And I hope to talk more with her about how we can be helpful. Yeah, she, she asked to get on your schedule. Yes. Right? Well, so we're happy to help. I mean, you guys sort of famously have a perpetual work from anywhere policy. Yes. I mean, let's start there. Doesn't, doesn't that hurt the city? You kind of rob some of the economic vitality, some of the foot traffic. You end up magnifying some of the problems of homelessness. Yep. When, 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 when does the responsibility to your hometown maybe sort of counterbalance some of the flexibility you want to give your employees? I think it's a great question. You always got to balance your different stakeholders. But we didn't say, like, don't live in San Francisco. We just said you can be flexible. Here's the interesting thing. A large percent of people have still chosen to be in San Francisco. And I still go to San Francisco office every single week. And I think since the pandemic, it's a different game now. I think that people now have a choice of where to live. And the moment somebody has a choice, then suddenly as a city, you're a little bit more in the customer service business. And so people start to ask, well, what kind of service am I getting? And so I would love to be able to helpful with the city of San Francisco to think, how can we continue to be able to serve the businesses? And in turn, the business can help serve the city. But we are really still rooted here. And I think that there's still going to be a huge boom coming to San Francisco. Okay. Now, maybe, maybe the mayor's still listening backstage. Uh, what, what would you like to see from her and her administration in terms of addressing some of the very visible problems here? Well, I think that, um, I'll just start with this first thing. I think that there could be a closer relationship between the city of San Francisco and the tech and business community. And that doesn't just include the mayor, that also includes the board of supervisors and other key stakeholders. And I think that's a two-way street. I think it's on us in the tech and business community, and I think it's on government that we need to be reaching more across the aisle. And I think if we have more dialogue and a little less ideology, we're going to actually start to solve problems. So I can make a list of all the ways San Francisco can be better, like we could do every city. But you have to start with where does it start? Everything starts with cooperation. And if we're battled in these ideological kind of narratives, we're not going to be working together. So we need to get to the table and all start working together. That's what we should do. Yeah, I mean, there definitely is a little bit of an anti-business bent in some of the ideological corners yeah. of city government. I think that, you know, you, you, you know me very well. I used to think that, like, you should stay away from government officials and people don't like you, you should avoid them. And I, I thought growing up, if somebody's, a, you know, going to cause trouble, stay away from them. And I hired an executive very early that you know, Belinda Johnson, and she was our original general counsel, and she said something to me that was counterintuitive. She said, if people don't like you or they have concerns, you should meet them. And I said, why would I do that? And she said, because it's hard to hate someone up close. And when you meet them, you understand their issues, they understand your issues. And I found that in every 100 meetings I have, 99 of the meetings, they hate us a little bit less, <laughs> we're a little bit closer together. And I think a little bit more cooperation, a little less arguing, is what we need in the world right now, especially in the city of San Francisco. We need to work together. Government is not gonna fix the problems. Business is not gonna fix the problems. We're gonna have to work together, and that starts with dialogue, and there's probably not enough of it. Karen asked the mayor what she wanted to see from some of the stakeholders in the city, and she said sort of help, well, we were having a little trouble yes. hearing backstage. I think she said help reimagining, reconceptualizing some of the uh, some of the spaces in yes. the city, particularly downtown. Yes. You're a design guy, right? You have a <laughs> yes. graduate degree. So help us reimagine 
the financial district, Westfield Mall. Yes. I mean, okay, I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah. But how can some of these urban areas, office areas, do you think be reutilized? I think that every, you know, out of crisis is opportunity. And when somebody moves out, somebody can move in. I think that there could be a potentially massive opportunity to rezone commercial spaces to be residential or mixed use. We have a long history in cities of dividing up zoning. This is a commercial district. This is a retail district. This is a residential district. And I think a very vibrant community is a multi-zone community. So it's not like quiet during the day or quiet at night or this is where people live and this is where people work. And actually these high-rise towers are better for living than working. And the reason why is a lot of people today want to live in open floor plans. Open floor plans are not small footprints. When people live in a space, they want a window view. And a small, tall floor plan like a, real, like, a, like a tower is great for housing. So I think if we made rezoning a little bit easier and really created incentives for people, that could be really interesting. I also think we're going to have a revolution around community spaces. More and more people are working remotely. They're not going to the physical office. You know, the mall is now Amazon. The theater is now Netflix. The grocery store for many people is now Instacart. And so many of these community spaces are, don't exist anymore. The bowling alley, the church. And so how do people gather in the future? We used to gather to shop. Yeah, we'd walk in a mall. I think now, fundamentally, we don't need to go to a physical mall to buy things. Amazon is really good at that. But we still need community. We are living in a wor we're probably living in the loneliest time in human history. And I think one of the problems in San Francisco and cities all over the world is we need to rebuild physical community. We need to be physically together. So I would say three things. One, try to turn more commercial into residential. Two, try to do more re rezoning where you do multi-use. And three, build community spaces. Could be co-working, it could be experiential spaces. We could go down the list of things you could do. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. We are both veterans of a couple of cycles yes. here in Silicon Valley, booms and busts. How are you viewing this six-month-old explosion oh of interest and investment around AI? Yeah, I've, uh, I came to Silicon Valley in late 2007. So I came at the rise of maybe three trends. The internet basically going global, um, mobile, and cloud. And those three trends did three things. Number one, it meant your user base wasn't a US user base, it was global. As you know, covering Amazon, the cost to start a company went down precipitously with AWS, and mobile meant you just had this distribution where you could be at people's fingertips every single hour of every day. I was in high school when the internet was coming up. I remember in the 90s, I was in middle school, high school, and so I don't have a great frame of reference of what this is like for the internet, but this feels like bigger than the internet and the 2000 cycle combined. It is, some people say it's the biggest technological wave since the Jeffrey Revolution. And I think this is just a massive acceleration. It is the platform shift of all platform shifts. There's going to be tons of overfunding. The vast majority of companies that get funded, probably like the last cycles, will either, will probably not exist as independent companies. They'll like morph or get sold. But I do think that um, it's a very exciting time. And I'm very, I think we're all very interested in AI. And I think that there aren't going to be AI companies. I think AI is going to be embedded in every single thing we do. OK, well, it's, it's not immediately intuitive, at least not to me, how that could impact Airbnb. So tell me, how is it, how is it meaningful for you guys? Yeah, I, so here's our mental model. So here's how I think about it. At, think of it, let's use some physical metaphors. So we have these large language models. I know Sam was here this morning and they do this large base foundational language models. And that is kind of like infrastructure, and we're not an infrastructure company. So if we're using a physical metaphor, that's like building a bridge. We don't build bridges, we don't do infrastructure. On top of the bridge, you have cars, which you might call applications, and that's what we do. Our real strength is we're really good at like design, interface, marketing, services, understanding how to apply technology. And so I'll give you a frame of reference. Let's say we go on ChatGPT and you ask ChatGPT a question, and I ask ChatGPT a question, we're probably going to get the same answer, or an almost identical answer. And that's great for questions like, what were the like, primary causes of the French Revolution, or like, how far is the Earth to the moon, like, kind of immutable like, answers. It turns out there's a whole bunch of questions where the answer depends on who you are. What should I wear? Who should I meet? Where should I go? What should I do with my life? Where should I travel? And so I think that our opportunity 
is to build the or one of the definitive AI interface layers. And it's all built around personalization. So instead of Airbnb just asking you where are you going and when are you going, we ask you some bigger questions like, well, who are you, Brad? What do you want? Like today, tomorrow, next year in your life. And the better we can understand you, the more we can be like the ultimate AI concierge pointing you to places, community, homes, experiences, and many more things. The only other thing I'll just say about AI, and I'll just bring this back to something that I've been thinking about, I'm excited and concerned about. AI obviously brings a huge amount of opportunity. I think it's gonna be a massive uh, boon for so many people. There's a couple ways to think about it. Number one, if the cost to start a company is lower, I think you're gonna have millions more entrepreneurs. So I think the number one thing you see from AI is more entrepreneurs. The second thing you see from AI is more software. Almost every single thing around us could one day have software because the biggest inhibitor to, as a designer, the biggest inhibitor I have is that not everyone speaks a computer programming language. But the moment AI can basically write that language, it can be that translator, you can prompt it. Suddenly anyone can create software, anyone can basically build a, build a company, and so many more things are gonna be alive. They're gonna be, I don't wanna say sentient, but they're gonna be able to, be able to take commands and do things. So that is gonna be a huge boon. I think it's easier to imagine the jobs will be displaced than the jobs will be created. I think that science will be revolutionized. Obviously, everyone can have a tutor, but I think there's so many more things we can do. We talk a lot about the risk to AI, um, and obviously, there's job displacement. I actually think, ultimately, it's gonna create a lot more jobs and destroy. I think the biggest two risks to AI that we're not talking about are, number one, just the speed. It's not that technology is a good or bad thing. Nuclear power can light up a city or destroy a city. It's how we use the technology. And the thing I'm a little concerned about is how fast it's happening, and are we gonna be able to bring society along on that change? We are accelerating a lot of trends. And one of the trends that we're accelerating is people are lonelier than they've ever been before. And we can debate what the causes of this are, but it's indisputable that like- You think like, AI is accelerating that problem? I think AI is gonna accelerate everything. And so whatever road we're going down, AI is gonna accelerate that road. It might change the course a little bit, but it's not gonna be a reverse on the highway. It's gonna be a, a super highway towards where we're going. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, are we happy with the road we're going down? Because we're about to accelerate that road. And if we wanna maybe make some course correction, now is the time to do it. And this is why I think the discussion shouldn't just be about AI, but should be about what kind of world do we wanna live in and what do we wanna do with this technology? And I think fundamentally, we need to make sure that you know, AI can deeply understand you, under know you, but it should not be your main friend. Okay, I mean, that, that is a lot to digest. Um, and not to be provincial here, but to bring it back to Airbnb, like your endemic challenge is always convincing the world, Wall Street, that you guys are a tech company and yes. not a travel company. So what, in this, in this blossoming of entrepreneurship and AI tools, what is Airbnb's advantage? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, um, there's a, there's a handful of them. Number one, at the end of the day, people still want to have great homes, great experiences. The vast majority of our hosts only list on Airbnb. We have a custom-built tools just for them. I think AI allows us eventually to have the equivalent of like an AI coach to help you become an even better host. I think additionally, you know, to our incredibly strong network effect, we have a lot of information about You've people. We have more than half a billion reviews that have been left on Airbnb. We know a lot about travelers. And I think instead of having a search problem like Google, we could have more of a matching problem. There is not one definitive right answer you come to Airbnb. So I think that like our innovative culture to be able to design these incredibly powerful interfaces to be able to match you to one of a kind experiences, I think that's gonna be our sweet spot. During the pandemic, you, you had to curtail Airbnb's yeah. ambitions a little bit. You shut down some stuff like the, the travel excursions on trips. But it struck me watching Emily's episode of The Circuit with you where you said you're really spending time imagining what Air, Airbnb can be now, that next phase of growth. So yeah, I mean, t what can you tell us about that and how integral is AI to, to, you, to what you're thinking about now for Airbnb's future? I think that AI will be at the center. I, if you think about before the pandemic, if you think about the business, we were on like this highway called travel. We were doing all sorts of things of travel. We were doing transportation, we had a travel magazine, we had a business travel division, and then suddenly we lose 80% of our business eight weeks, 
It's like we have this near business death experience, our business flashed before our eyes, and it's like you're going into a house, and the house is burning, and you can only take a couple things out of your house, and those became our priorities. And we decided to get really, really focused. But when that happened, like many of you in the pandemic, you start to ask yourself, like, well, what's important to me? And I think what we realized is what's important to us isn't per se travel. I mean, I love traveling like anyone does, and it's not even housing, it's something deeper. When Joe and I started Airbnb, and then Nate joined us a few months later, but that first weekend, October 2007, it was really about connecting with people. It was about hosting people. And I think that is something that we need now more than ever. I mean, you know, the amount of people just in this country that don't have close friends, that are lonely, have trouble meeting each other, what that's doing to us, dividing our society, causing mental health issues. I'm not saying we're gonna solve that problem, but I would like to be able to focus Airbnb more on being in the business of connecting people, and I think travel is why you do it. A home is the pretext for that. But I think that's what we're gonna try. Well, that's interesting because you, you started with home sharing, renting a room, the host is there, yeah. but I had always assumed that the reason that you went more towards an emphasis on really taking over a home or a property, it's because your customers led you there. That yes. They, you know, that there's something maybe human nature-ish about being uncomfortable yes. with uh, your host down the hallway sharing a bathroom. Yes. Yes. So are you getting a signal from customers that they want to return to a sharing, connecting model? It's kind of interesting, Brad. The thing is, I think it's our temptation to always gravitate towards technology. And I think technology, one of the things it does is it likes efficiency. It wants to find the fastest point between A and B. And the thing about human connection is it's inefficient. And so what technology wants to do is to take the human connection off and out of something because that something can be inefficient. If you ask people, do you want to meet somebody? They say no. We, it's our instinct to isolate ourselves, to push people away. But you ask them after they've had that connection, are they happy? And they say, I'm so thankful for the people in my life, and one of the most important things about my life are not all the things I have, it's the relationships I have. The longest study on happiness is an 85-year-old Harvard longitudinal study, and the question was, what's the secret to happiness? They did not think they would have a definitive answer, and of course they did. The definitive answer is the secret to happiness are relationships. So, it's a little bit complicated. I don't ask people what they, what they want, I look at what they value after we give them things. What I've seen is the most meaningful things in Airbnb, the reasons that people stick to the company. We say money and space is the hook, but the relationships, either the trips you go on with people or the people you meet, that's the hook. That's the thing that roots you in the company, and that's what we're going to be going towards. Okay, I want to hit one more point. Hopefully this morning you all have noticed that we've aligned on a couple of themes in all our conversations. We've been talking a lot about AI, we've been talking about San Francisco, yeah. and we've also been trying to hit some of the geopolitical issues with regards yeah. to China. I know you guys closed a business in China. Was it last uh, end the of 2020 or business, last year? Last yeah, year. you know the the Biden administration is really pushing divestiture, um, particularly on on AI. Um, you know, you've got experience, probably frustrating experience, trying to start a domestic business there. I, from your perch, what is the right thing to do here in China? Yeah, I think that I think I'm an optimist. I don't really want to live in a world where there's two internets. I think one of the things that has surprised me most since I started the company, I mean, people ask, what have you learned starting the company? The number one thing I've learned is not how different we are, it's how similar we are. And isn't it funny that people, the strongest opinions of other people, the ones without passports? And as you travel the world, you start to realize we're more alike than we are different. I think the promise of the internet was, was going to bring us together. And I'm generally concerned that we are now creating a divided two-world system with the internet. And so I think we have to have red lines. We have to be really thoughtful about having to come together. But I really hope that this is not an acceleration of us drifting apart. It's a way to come together. Ultimately, though, it was very hard to run a domestic business in China. We pulled out. You can still use Airbnb in China to travel around the world, and we're going to continue to support that. Brian, our time blazed by. Yes. Everybody should watch Emily's episode of The Circuit with Brian. It's really amazing. Brian Chesky, thank you.